So thank you to uh, Mayor Bonnie Crombie for taking time for her from her very busy schedule to come on to the 905er. Thank you very much for joining us to talk about uh, this is going to be a big, potentially a big issue for, for the, not just 905, but Mississauga and Peel and uh, as a whole. So thank you very much for coming on to the podcast. Well, thank you very much for having me. I'm delighted to be able to have the opportunity to talk about this very important issue. Well, uh, on that, um, we're something that Roland and I have just been kind of batting back and forth amongst ourselves is, you know, why now of all times in Mississauga's existence, uh, are, are, are you pushing for Mississauga to leave Peel? Why, why now is it, do you have the urgency to put this on the agenda officially and make the push to the, uh, to the province to do this? Um, so I've never stopped advocating uh, for a single tier independent city of Mississauga. Certainly Hazel did before me. We went through one round of regional governance review with Premier Kathleen Wynne, uh, and she wasn't prepared to move forward. And then when Doug Ford was elected Premier, he went through um, a governance review with eight different regions. And we saw some hope that perhaps he had the political will to do the right thing and to separate Peel. I mean, Mississauga, with our almost 800,000 population and the second largest economy, even though we're the third largest city, uh, has a right to stand on its own in the same way cities like London, Brantford, Ottawa, Windsor, who have I missed? Kingston, Guelph, Chatham, mm -hmm. Kent, all do. Uh, so why shouldn't the third largest city be an independent city? So this is a push I have continued to make. I also use it as a platform item in my re-election campaign. Um, and then uh, the premier signaled that he was quite supportive of uh, very smaller, flexible cities, because of course, all our joint goal, our mutual goals are to build more housing. We've all, we've all signed the pledge to build housing. Uh, and I've made the case that a single tier city is much more flexible to churn out permits um, because there are fewer layers of red tape and duplication, fewer approvals, et cetera. It could happen faster. And then when the premier announced that he believed in strong mayor powers and would be giving those to Toronto and Ottawa first, I asked the question, will we be eligible as well, given we're single, excuse me, uh, two-tier municipalities, not single tier, and how would that work in a two-tier government? Mm -hmm. and that gave him pause for concern, which I was very pleased to say that, yes, that would be a little more difficult to execute in a two-tier system. Uh, uh, and so the, we waited some period of time and the premier had been signaling that it was time to do this regional governance review once again and, and come to some conclusions because how else would he allow the third and fourth largest city in Ontario, Mississauga and Brampton to execute on uh, su uh, 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 super mayor powers. That's, that was all very good news. So yeah, uh, uh, yeah. No, those, are, those are all very, they're very valid points, and I, we're going to circle back. There, uh, before we go do that, though, there's just a, a, there's a statistic that I see you citing a lot in the press, and I'm wondering if you can elaborate on it. And that's the the fact that you you say that Mississauga is paying sixty percent of the cost to Peel Region, yet you're only getting fifty percent of the vote. Very well, very perfect. I, 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 well, I I made sure I double checked the Toronto Star before <laughs> before I quoted it, but I'm can you just elaborate on on that what how how do, how do you calculate that uh seeming imbalance in uh in the political equation well actually for the past we are the region is 50 years old and i will share with you that for the first 40 years we paid 70 percent of the costs and still made an incremental transfer to brampton for roads planning and policing now the current numbers are a little bit lower given brampton's growth but we continue to pay 60% of the costs at the region of Peel. It's just given our population and our assessment. So we pay 60% of the costs from Mississauga transfer to the region of Peel to pay their costs. Plus an incremental, hold on to your seats, $84 million every year, every year to Brampton. And that is because we have the higher assessment base and the policing formula is largely assessment based. So notwithstanding the policing issues in in Brampton Mississauga residents and taxpayers uh, pay for policing in Brampton 
Um, and as you have rightly pointed out, we only have 50% of the vote at the region. So there's no taxation in rep for representation either. So obviously, I mean, it will come as a surprise to no one that, that, that your, your colleague in Brampton, uh, Mayor Patrick Brown, has a, has a different perspective. Um, uh, he's saying, well, you know, we're the ones who are doing the, the, the subsidizing here or, or uh, you know, we need to be we need to be made whole if, if, if this were to go yeah. ahead. Um, uh, what's your argument back against that? Yeah. So uh, I think if there are any alimony payments to be paid in this divorce, <laughs> They're coming to Mississauga, not to Brampton. Uh, let's be honest, the region was created at a time where Mississauga was being built out and our development charges and our taxpayer dollars were being uh, uh, transferred to the region and paying for the growth of the region. And that happened for the first 40 years at 70% uh, of our revenue, uh, of the region's revenue rather. And within the past 10 years, that number has started to come down for 66%. And now we're about 60% of, uh, of, the, uh, of the cost of the region. Uh, so, you know, it is our development charges and the building out of Mississauga that has paid for all the infrastructure across the region and for the growth in Brampton. So I think this is a red herring that Mayor Brown had to find an argument. <laughs> so this is the one he's using. In addition, he's using taxes will increase if we proceed. Oh, I'm sure they will in Brampton. We've, uh, we've done the analysis and that we know Mississauga will save upwards of a billion dollars within 10 years. Once so, we separate, and I mean, I think there will be some in initial costs, you know, separating everything. And we know that facilitators are coming in and they will certainly analyze who owns which assets and which can be divided and how so. Um, and, and uh, you know, there may be some initial costs in the separation, but over the long run, without having to subsidize the region and without having to transfer Brampton uh funding for their policing their roads and their planning we're much further ahead so i mean so this is fantastic for mississauga as it uh, is uh, of tax so they're, they're going to be getting a tax cut then because you're going to be saving all this money you can over time the tax cut. over time <laughs> Yes, you know, I, I do hope that that is the case. So, so right. certainly over time, over 10 years, we will we will uh, save a lot of money and hopefully taxes could potentially could potentially uh, stabilize or decrease. Okay. And, you know, what, what struck me as very unfair to my taxpayers, uh, my taxpayers want to see our tax dollars reinvested in our city, not pay for the growth of Brampton and Caledon. And what we saw was the past five years that Mayor Brown has been mayor, Four of those years, he froze municipal taxes. So here we raise taxes responsibly to meet our debt obligations, um, meet our projections for our capital plan, our operating plan, um, and and he got and he was able to freeze his. So you know, I think that that struck a note, a very sour note, <laughs> with my counselors mm -hmm. and my residents. Uh, I, I, on that note, uh, the question. That I think some some folks would have is why why leave why leave Peel region um, and why not just fix that imbalance? Um, you know, well, the it, funding it... formulas would have to be changed. But more mm -hmm. importantly, when development proposals or anything comes to the region, what happens is is we have other municipalities that have to agree to our decisions and our priorities. Right. My issue is I want to control our own destiny. I want to have all the commissioners. Um, at one table to make the decision once, not have to go up to the region and sell the other two municipalities on what should be my priorities and not have them, them sign off on them. So okay. <laughs> I, I guess the- And plus, let's be honest, you know, they have equal votes to us. Well, I, yeah, I, I guess that's the, the, I mean, we I understand the the voting structure. I'm, I'm trying to play devil's advocate here a bit and just say, it sounds that the Peel region, I, I understand uh, Mayor Brown also had issues with uh, uh, duplication of service and duplication of-, of Absolutely, policy. well, think about it. You know, we've got yeah. two planning departments, two transit works departments. We have uh, admin people that are duplicated, legal people that are duplicated. Think about every department right. that has to comment on app development. And I, I, th I don't think anybody would fault you for saying, do away with that, that's ridiculous. Certainly, I know Will and I would agree with that. But the you know the question people the, your critics I know are are voicing is now we've got to go reset um, police we have to set up a new public health department uh, 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 sanitation all those things that were originally handed by the region of Peel 
wouldn't it might not make more sense to say, well, let's keep sharing that cost because we already have that set up, but let's just change this, all this policy level so we don't have duplication of services or, or right. So just, let me address what do you say that? Yeah, sure. let me address some of those. So the funding formulas can be changed. Let's take Peel Police for an example. Mm -hmm. um, I would keep all this uh, regional services intact, like Peel Police, paramedics, uh, fire has always been at the municipal level in any case, but it's the funding formula that has to be changed. It has to go to user pay, right? Like the OPP model, let's call it mm -hmm. that. Now, with respect to waste, and waste is based in Brampton, but wastewater, of course, the treatment plant is in Mississauga because we're proximate to the lake. So that makes sense. So we both share headquarters and critical assets. For instance, he will argue that I have the headquarters for Peel Regional Police. Granted, that's a new, new facility that was purchased within the past five years. He has paramedic headquarters. So it's pretty equally distributed. Um, so I have argued I hope persuasively uh, that this all should be put into a utility and people should pay by usage, run by a board perhaps. So whatever waste, wastewater, et cetera, um, have that be user pay and go right into a utility. I don't know if there's such a word called utilitize it, but that's what I would advocate. So um... now listen, one more thing. On mm -hmm. Peel Public Health, nothing was more evident to me was that we needed our own public health department than during COVID when we oh, were please. in lockdown primarily because Brampton was driving numbers with being home to the essential workers, et cetera, that drove our economy. I respect that. But my businesses were in lockdown watching their customers cross the street and go to Oakville because Oakville was open because they were part of Halton region and Halton was open, but mm -hmm. Peel was closed. Our numbers were significantly better. So we had to be in lockdown uh, because of the numbers generated from Brampton. And if people said, well, why do our businesses have to shutter? Why are my customers going across the street to Oakville? That's fundamentally unfair. And I said, because we have only one regional public health department. So it was became very evident to my residents that we needed our own public health official. We, uh, I mean, one of the, 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 the big things that we've you know, done on this podcast, we're almost reaching our third year now. Um, and certainly, uh, you know, we, we've been dealing week in, week out with the problems of local government, perhaps more than anything else. Um, but the problem seems to us always to be not so much um, the, the, the current way that the, the governments are divided up, uh, the, the boundaries, it's the fact that the province will overrule everything at the drop of a hat. Now, we've just seen an excellent example of that on Friday, 4.30 p.m. Friday afternoon, I think it was. With the province saying that you know, uh, planning decision that has gone through all the usual processes in Mississauga, gone uh, probably literally years of work by by planners and by councillors, um, is just going to be torn up, thrown in the garbage, and overruled uh, by the province. I mean, isn't that the real problem uh, in in local government right now that that you and other councillor, uh, other mayors should should be addressing and kind of screaming from the rooftops about? Well, we are. <laughs> we are. I, I see it as quite a bit of inter interference into local planning and zoning. We have worked very well with the community over the past 13 years and given them our assurances. Um, and then five o'clock on a Friday evening of a long weekend, an MZO was dropped without my awareness. I wasn't given the heads up and it was done ahead of the public consultation meeting that is occurring this evening, which is the Monday following the Friday decision. So if anything, they could have waited to hear the discussion um, at the planning meeting to really understand how the residents felt. Um, it's, a, it's, it's a stretch. I think I called it a bridge too far. We, uh, we had originally envisioned that new community on 167 acres and we have 67 of those acres um, for innovation corridor. Uh, to be 5,000 units. And of course, the development community negotiated hard with us. So we saw fit, given that they would be contributing back some infrastructure and, and community benefits at the time, to raise it to 8,000 units, which was also a stretch at the time. So the fact that it doubled without giving me a heads up at five o'clock on a Friday, the weekend before the public consultation, 
is very concerning. It's very, very disappointing. And they had indicated to us that mayor or council would need to approve a request for an MZO. So there was no approval from the mayor or from the council. And the local councillor is, is beside himself. We, we didn't see this coming. And, and um, I have to share with you, I don't know if you know that portion of Mississauga that is adjacent to the Etobicoke border on Lakeshore. It's a four lane road. It's a mm -hmm. road. It can't accommodate the traffic that exists there today. We're getting a partial BRT in a few years. We've been promised a GO train station on Ogden on the Lakeshore line once that line is electrified. So how many years from today? But 16,000 units will accommodate somewhere between 50 and 75,000 people on four lanes of road that doesn't have sufficient infrastructure around it to access uh, higher order transit or, um, hi or highways. So transit transportation is a real concern, as is the fact that we would now be building a community the size of Woodstock or Belleville, but without community amenities, such as community centers, uh, paramedic, fire stations, police stations, et cetera, uh, schools that will accommodate the children that will live there. Um, so this hasn't been given any consideration. We were concerned about the lack of infrastructure in that development when it was at, when we were thought we were building 8,000 units and now it is doubled. And I'm very concerned about the density that, that that's introducing. And quite frankly, that community isn't even complete yet because there's another development proposal that is adjacent to Lakeshore called Rangeview that will be asking for similar density. So, it you know, I, I, I let me just say one more thing, because this is very important. I don't oppose density. I am intensifying Mississauga. I embrace it. But it also has to be reasonable and it has to be smart. I don't want to build a city that aligns boulevards, shiny towers, single bedrooms. And that's what I feel is happening here. That's not the kind of city I want to grow. I want one with character and space, creative spaces, places for artists, places where people play music and meet. And this doesn't satisfy that objective whatsoever. I have so, no guarantees the infrastructure will be built in. There's been some rumors recently, and you're gonna know fine and well what those rumors are that, that have associated you with maybe running for the, the leadership of the uh, Ontario Liberals. Um, in which position you'd be in, you know, imagine you in, in Doug Ford's position. I mean, would you make a commitment now that you would never use MZOs? Um, is that something you'd be willing to do? So let's talk hypothetically about MZOs and their use. I think they should be used very rarely. Uh, we passed a motion here at Mississauga Council that MZOs, with the approval of council uh, and the mayor, could be used in certain circumstances. And for, for my part, I see them as a, a acceptable when building affordable housing, not attainable because I'm not sure what that means uh, and not market housing or perhaps long-term care. for So for development that's for a greater social good, a greater community good, I could see my way to accepting the use of an MZO with the approval of the council. But in this situation, I see what's happening is 90% market housing and far too much of it for the site and a deficiency in the community benefits that make any community thrive. Um, Open spaces and uh, you know, uh, uh -huh. community spaces and paramedic stations and fire stations, police stations, everything I've reiterated. And you, you know what, you've stood with, with, the, with, with the premier today and he's, he's obviously, he's signaled more strongly today than, than before that he's in favor of, of Mississauga going his own route. And he's actually announced that he's always been in favor of it, which is news to me, I have to say, but maybe I missed that. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, is this kind of like part of the trade-off that happens now that, 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 that is like, okay, you, you, you suck up this MZO, um, uh, and we'll, we'll give you this, this, this other deal over here. Well, it was three MZOs that were dropped five o'clock on Friday. Um, you know, I, I have made my points very clear that I didn't think this was appropriate, uh, that I, we don't agree with it. And from what I understand, it is final. 
and we will be working with facilitators, land facilitators that will come in and evaluate, you know, how much infrastructure support is required for to build in the transit and transportation networks that are required. Um, the social programming, the community services, the police stations, fire stations, et cetera, paramedic that will be needed, schools uh, that will be needed. So we'll be working with a facilitator. Um, am I a little bit fearful of speaking out too strongly until this legislation is, is announced a little bit? <laughs> this has been a goal of mine since before I got elected. It was a goal of Hazel's, you know, in her last terms of mayor. Uh, so of course I want to fulfill that legacy and it's been so important to me. It was part of my election platform this time around my third election. I wanted to bring this home and we're very, yeah. very close. So it's, you know, I, I think I've made it known that I wasn't supportive of the MZO or the approach taken because at a minimum I should have been given a heads up and they should have done it after the community consultation, not before. Um, but certainly we are, you know, we all have our fingers and toes crossed here that this is going to go forward, save a lot of our Mississauga taxpayers a lot of money. We'll take those tax dollars and invest them into our own priorities, our own programs, our own services. Think about the potential investment into our infrastructure, our transit networks, et cetera, rather than transferring them uh, to support the growth of Brampton. You know, the, the mayor can say what he wants about him contributing 25 or 30 cents on the dollar for the past 50 years. The reality is Mississauga built out his infrastructure at the same time we built our infrastructure. What are what has been the public reception to this uh, uh, discussion happening? Um, because there hasn't been, a, you know, any public referendum. I, I know that you did run on it in the last election, yep. but I, I would argue that's not necessarily people vote elected you for multiple reasons than just uh, this one. I, I, do you think it's prudent maybe to put this to the citizens of Mississauga to to understand what their their feelings are on this that you know they might there might be an overwhelming support for this but i just, I, just I, I was i would think we in the later recent events around the world um kind of putting this stuff to the public to the people to say mm -hmm. do you want to leave this level of government that you elect into and that you do pay taxes into do you want to leave is there do you do, would you be open to that kind of that that uh that argument to be made be open to it but I really don't think it's necessary we've done a lot of public opinion polling in Mississauga we know there's overwhelming support for it um, at the same time I know they elected me to manage their finances and I'm a pretty strong financial steward um, and I know that they trust me and I think perhaps the, the case hadn't been made um, you know under the wind government or you know previously maybe under the first government review I heard from the regional chair i've heard from the mayor brampton if it's not fixed why if it's not broken why fix it it's broken it is very broken it's broken for my taxpayer so maybe to the north of us there's great advantage to keeping the status quo mm -hmm. but, but there's no advantage to us you know sometimes you're in a relationship where one partner is the giver and the other is the taker and that is the case here so it's time it we've had we we are 50 years old next year and it's really time that we stand on our own two feet and that we control our own destiny and that we invest our tax dollars into our priorities and our services and programs, not send them to another municipality to pay again for their growth. My my last, I just have one last question on this topic, then I'll throw it over to you, Roland. Uh, I, again, when, when you hear anything exit, immediately people consider Brexit and, and whatnot. And there's always these unintended consequences of an action like this. Um, and I guess you as the one spearheading this initiative, how how prepared are you to deal with those unintended, the fallout and the unintended, unintended consequences of leaving Peel Region, whatever they might be down the road? Yeah, well, I'll face everything head on. I have a, an incredible team here at the city of Mississauga and we're ready. We're ready. We're ready to undertake this. We've had studies. You know, we had the uh, Ernst & Young report done back during the last governance review. We know what the issues are. We know what the costs will be. We know what the savings will be. And that's what we're basing our, our, um, our arguments on. So we're ready. We're great financial stewards. I will share with you 
You know, we saved $77 million of taxpayers' money since 2009 um, just through savings initiatives, whether it was cuts, cutting programs, cutting departments through lean, many different ways. We've created savings for our taxpayers. It's been an average of three to four, sometimes some years, $5 million a year. And we've also maintained a AAA credit rating throughout it all. So, you know, we are a mighty Mississauga. We're with, ready and willing to face this head on and do the best job for our taxpayers. Uh, that all sounds like great things, but, but, but aren't you also looking to maybe get a promotion to a different job? <laughs> so <laughs> now there's... <laughs> Uh, there's no secret that I'm looking at this because I've just hear an overwhelming uh, kind of push to consider it. And so it is a very serious decision and it, I, I don't take it lightly. You know, I, I love Mississauga. I love my job. I love the people here. I love the work. Um, but at the same time, what I hear from people is you are a strong manager. You're transparent. You're accountable. Uh, we like how you run the city. Couldn't you take those same management principles, management style, and, and apply them in a transparent way, the way you do uh, to the other cities in the province? And it's it you know it does I it is something to think about. Final question. We, we've taken up lots of your time, but um, I mean, given your experience as mayor, and you've obviously this. Is if you were to move on it would be your third level of government you'd kind of you'd get the full set <laughs> it's um, true i've already i served it too <laughs> um what what is the biggest problem that you've seen with the way that municipal government works in ontario in the last decade and and you know if you were in the position that uh, premier ford is in what mm. would be the first thing you'd do to to to, to change the way things are done yeah, that's an easy question. Well, first of all, I'd listen to municipalities. I'd meet with them regularly. Um, you know, the cabinet is very accessible to us. I've asked Premier Ford a number of times to meet with the Ontario big city mayors. I'm the chair of that caucus and he's agreed to. So I'm looking forward to scheduling that meeting, but it's revenue tools. It's long-term sustainable funding for cities. You know that we can't build any aspirational projects. Here in Mississauga, we wanted to retrofit um, public transit, higher order public transit. So we're building an LRT, but that wasn't possible in our budget. We're not allowed to run deficits. You know, we, we only can raise enough revenue to pay our bills, to pay for our programs and services that are in place. So any large billion dollar aspirational project, we have to go to a different order of government, provincial or federal to pay our bills. So it, it, it's long time pass, has passed that we sit down and analyze uh, the way municipalities are funded. We were created during an, an agrarian part of our, uh, of our existence. You know, the, Canada was largely an agrarian, uh, agricultural country when, when towns started forming and cities started forming uh, and the funding, we were created by the province and the funding came from the province. But those days are gone and we're being expected to build world class cities with you know, 20th century cities with 19th century revenue tools, which are very regressive. They're property taxes and we're expected to deal with issues that we had never expected to deal with. Let's start with mental health and addictions, you know, climate change issues and then large aspirational infrastructure projects. Our, pro our budgets aren't designed to accommodate any of that. So there's downloading from the province to deal with health, health care. You know, if we get a new hospital, we have to make a contribution from the municipality. Mental health, addictions issues, uh, climate change issues. These are all downloaded to cities and cities aren't equipped financially to cope with them. So I think the revenue model, the funding model has to be looked at more closely. I've had the opportunity to meet with mayors across the US, uh, across Europe and across the world, quite frankly. And there are more successful formulas that can be applied. Uh, for instance, we can talk about a share of the uh, income tax. Why not split that three ways rather than two ways? You know, we, we would all agree that property taxes are very regressive. How much can I raise your property taxes each year to build the kind of projects that I would like to see here in Mississauga? So you, you'd be looking to turn back the clock a little bit on, I mean, I would say, both the previous Liberal administration, both under Premier McGuinty and Wynne uh, and Ford government, 
they've kind of taken powers away from the municipalities, particularly on development and planning. Well, uh, and primarily this that. government has taken a lot of powers away from us on planning and zoning and local planning. It's, it's certainly accelerated, yeah. So it, you would, I mean, I'm, what I'm hearing is, you know, trust the municipalities to do their jobs. That, that, that would no, be I think we're the best uh, fiscal managers. We're not even permitted to run a deficit. We're completely, we have completely balanced books each year. And that's why we can't build, we can't exceed our, our, our plans, our 10-year capital plan, our annual capital plan, our, you know, our operations budget. We can't exceed that. It's all we can raise through our property taxes is what we expect to spend. Well, that might be a, a whole discussion for a, a, a future Another episode. Well, be a great if, if, a, if an announcement is made uh, in time, you, you're more than welcome to come on and we discuss this far more in, del- in depth and far more in detail um, by all means. Uh, but thank you very much, Mayor Crombie, for taking your time to come on. I know you have uh, more meetings to attend to later today, so we'll let you get to it. Uh, but thank you very much for your time and uh, look forward to see what happens next. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me today. Thanks so much.